all know the setting. You're at a birthday party of your friend, meeting new people, and someone asks you a fairly obvious question. What do you do for a living? I hate that question. Not because I don't like my job. I love my job. It's probably my favorite thing in my life right now. It's because people always tend to think differently of me when I tell them. I always end up having to explain myself. They think, I'm some kind of Frankenstein, creating zombies. They think I do horrible stuff to babies. They think I'm injecting food with toxic chemicals. So what do I do for a living? I'm a researcher who studies DNA editing. We are living in an age where humans are killing nature and nature is killing humans. Human intervention has caused deforestation, extinction, climate change. But nature is fighting back. Think of antibiotic resistance, parasites, diseases we cannot cure. I think the only way to set this imbalance between humans and nature straight again is by changing the core of life itself, DNA. And that's really what I do for a living. I want to address current environmental and medical issues by editing DNA. However, this is something that many people find scary and unethical. When they think of DNA editing, they don't directly think of me. They think of an old scientist in a white coat in a dark lab doing scary stuff. And can you blame them? A group in America is trying to resurrect the woolly mammoth by editing the DNA of elephants. You can even buy do-it-yourself DNA editing kits online, and people have started to inject them in their bodies like they're some kind of superhumans. Recently, a Chinese scientist has edited the DNA of two embryos, making them resistant to HIV but probably also enhancing their brains in the process. And this was not an experiment. He claims those children were actually born, that we already have two DNA-edited babies walking the earth. So does it mean that you can come to me and order your perfect baby? Well, no, I want to stop it right there. Because DNA editing has this whole other side, these other applications that nobody talks about but that can save lives. I am going to show you that DNA editing is not something to be scared about. And not only that, it is going to be a key technology that can save lives in the near future. I want to start by setting one thing straight. DNA editing is not a human invention. Every cell, every living being has a system to change its DNA. Giraffes were first tiny animals who were starving because they couldn't reach the upper leaves until their DNA changed. We were first some kind of monkeys until our DNA changed. Every cell, every living being has a system to change its DNA in order to adapt, to survive, to evolve. And with DNA editing, we are steering this DNA changing in the direction that we need. Basically, we are giving evolution a big push in a certain direction. I always like to illustrate this with the following example. Back in the days, insulin for diabetes patients was taken from pigs. And we needed to slaughter 20 pigs in order to get only one gram of insulin. So many pigs died, and many people died, because insulin was hard to get by. Nowadays, we use DNA-edited bacteria to produce insulin. We have added a piece of human DNA to these bacteria so that they can produce insulin, which we can clean and give to humans. And we only need one tiny drop of bacteria 
to produce just as much insulin as these 20 pigs. And this technology is now saving millions of lives, not only of pigs, but also of humans. And it was actually this exact story that inspired me to become a DNA engineer. It felt like such a tiny change could have such a huge impact. I have been changing the DNA of microorganisms, of bacteria and yeast, for a while now. I have been studying how we can use yeast to tackle climate change. As you know, many of the things we use today, like fuels, textiles, plastics, are produced by a chemical industry that pollutes our planet and creates toxic waste. Turns out, if you edit the DNA of yeast, it can not only produce beer and bread, what we know it for, but it can also produce fuels, and it can produce plastics, even medicine, without creating this toxic waste, which gives us a shot at making our industry greener. And recently, there was a revolution in our field. The DNA-changing system of bacteria was discovered, called CRISPR-Cas. And since then, the speed of research has skyrocketed. Everyone dropped what they were doing, and they started using CRISPR. Because it turned out that with CRISPR, you can not only edit the DNA of bacteria, but with this technique, you can also edit the DNA of yeast. You can edit the DNA of plants, of animals. And you can edit the DNA of humans. And this has opened up a range of possibilities that we thought were never possible before. We have a shot at curing diseases we cannot cure. Alzheimer's, cystic fibrosis, ALS, cancer. Those are diseases that occur because of a tiny mistake in your DNA. And with CRISPR, we can potentially fix those. We can make mosquitoes resistant to malaria and Zika, so these diseases stop spreading. We can fight antibiotic resistance. We can grow healthier food. We can grow meat. We can even grow donor organs. For every biology-based problem we have in the world right now, we can now try and find a solution. And my hands are itching to start changing DNA, to fight diseases, to save our environment, to make our food healthier. And of course, we have to be careful. Because cells are so immensely complex that we still don't fully understand how they work. And because of that, we sometimes run into limitations of DNA editing technologies. So we have to figure those out first, and all research efforts are focused on that now. And I really wanted to work on the forefront here, so that became the topic of my PhD. Together with scientists in Delft, in the Netherlands, and even worldwide, we are trying to understand how cells work, how life works, so we can fix it. And my expertise here has become the DNA of the cell. What does this DNA look like? How can we build it? How can we repair it? So that when the world is ready for CRISPR, we have the best and safest tool we can possibly use. So when will the world be ready for CRISPR? When can we expect this DNA editing revolution to take place? Well, I'm afraid not anytime soon. That's because people rather stick to old techniques that they know. Right now, it's incredibly difficult to implement your DNA editing solution in the real world. The European ev court even ruled that the use of CRISPR in plants is forbidden. And that's mostly because people don't want genetically modified food that doesn't sound natural, so that must be bad for you, right? Well, Funny thing, if you walk into a supermarket, none of the fruits and vegetables you will see there look anything like they did 100 years ago. That's because we've already been changing them, we've already been optimizing them to make the fruit look nicer, to make it juicier, to make fruit seedless. And we have been doing this with old techniques like inbreeding and UV radiation. To put this in human terms, these plants have been breeding with their brothers and sisters. 
or they have been exposed to the full afternoon sun for hours without any sunscreen. You can imagine the damage that would do to a human body. And guess what? It's the same for those plants, only they get a nicer tomato out of it. If we were to use CRISPR, we would only add a piece of DNA to the plant that makes the fruit look nicer, and we leave the rest of the plant as untouched as it can be. So no, genetically modified foods are not toxic, they're not bad for you. It's the same plant, sometimes even less damaged than what you're eating right now. Yet CRISPR is forbidden, and those old techniques are fine. And that really is a slap in the face to scientists like me. It is completely justified to be cautious about new technologies, but it should not get in the way of progress. Think of it as driving a car. Everyone agrees that cars are super useful. They get you from A to B in no time. And everyone can drive a car as long as you have a license and you stay on the road and you follow the rules. It should be like that for DNA editing. But right now, there are no licenses. There are no consistent regulations. There are no roads to follow if you want to take your DNA editing solution outside the lab. So right now, outside of a lab, everything just stands still. I realize that DNA editing has the power to do things that are well outside of our current comfort zone. But we should not let those fears get in the way of progress. People are afraid that we will use DNA editing to create superhumans, but those kind of applications won't happen for the next centuries, if they're even possible at all. Instead, we should focus on all the good things that we can do with DNA editing on a much shorter time frame. I truly believe in the power of DNA editing and that it can change the world. Because with DNA editing, we have a shot at curing diseases. We can make our food healthier and we can fight climate change. And I think that is the real superpower of DNA editing that you should think of. Thank you.